die, you can either be injured, you can get a communicable disease, or you can get a chronic non-communicable disease, cardiovascular disease, heart disease, hypertension, stroke, chronic kidney disease, cancer, chronic respiratory diseases. And you see, age begets the development of non-communicable diseases. And so if you look here, 15 to 49, across the globe or at various different geographies, the most people actually ultimately die from non-communicable diseases. And as you get older, the proportion of people who die from that get even greater. But they live for a long time with many, many years of poor quality life associated with these problems. So we've got an ageing population, we've got a world's growing population, we're accumulating non-communicable diseases, and the most important part about it is that non-communicable diseases get non-communicable diseases. So this graph is complex, but if you think down there on the, on the uh, y-axis, there are all the various conditions that might be considered a chronic non-communicable disease. And if I just ask you to look at the heart failure, the bottom line, and you can see that the vast majority of people who have heart failure over the age of 65 have five other conditions, five other non-chronic conditions, ageing population, growing population, more non-communicable diseases, and as you live longer, you actually acquire more illnesses. Now in my career, almost every clinical technology, medical, pharmaceutical that has come along has been supported by a clinical trial. And we prove out that that actually works. But we do that by carefully excluding patients and carefully defining the inclusion criteria just to prove the concept. But we don't compound it with people who have five other illnesses. And then we say this therapy actually works and we go out and generalise that and translate that and say this is the therapy for everybody. But it's not truly generalisable. But if you don't give it to people, then you're not abiding by evidence-based medicine. But evidence-based medicine does, in today's world doesn't really take into account the nuances of how the therapy would apply to people who are old and who have multiple non-communicable diseases, such as you can see here. A lot more of the purple on that graph than there are patients with the green. So in the 21st century, healthcare has to be different, and it is going to be different. We have to move away from transactional acute solutions to longitudinal solutions, solutions that actually run in parallel with the course of human life and indeed with the course of disease. We have to have much better preventative strategies, much cleverer, much more uh, intelligent preventative strategies, more predictive, more precise, more accurate, more personalizable. We have to have new product innovation that meets the confluence of med tech and, uh, and digital technology so that they are not just simply a therapeutic uh, intervention at one point in your life, but they're also providing diagnostic material that prevents readmission from hospital or preve prevents you needing another therapeutic option or perhaps even directs you to what other therapeutic option you might need. And more importantly, because we're going to have so many old people with so much uh, chronic disease, we have to deliver and support care in non-traditional settings. The hospital today isn't the hospital of 2050. It's going to be a smart enabled home with connected devices and that will provide truly accessible care. Now, the two words I'm going to repeat from here on, which is a mantra for my entire medical career after 30 years in, in, in practice, is access and equity. Because there is no point us developing therapies for the top 1% of people and having the other 99% languish. We have to have therapeutic options that are both accessible and equitable. And if you have those two, then they're meaningful. And so for therapy to be delivered and be able to be monitored in non-traditional settings, allowing shared decision making, then it's accessible and then it's equitable. Now, to achieve that, you'd say, well, you need three things. You need an infrastructure. Do we, not only would we need a digital infrastructure, but we actually need to have patient receptivity. They buy in, they want it, and it works. 
and ultimately you have to have questions that you can solve and treat with the therapy. And I don't need to tell you anything on this slide. You know that there are lots of internet users, you know that there's lots of smartphones, and you know that there's lots of uh, connected devices, and there's going to be more and more of those that will provide information into the large data lake from which we can actually do very intelligent augmentation of healthcare because of the capability of doing analytics on so much data. So the infrastructure is there. You know more about it than I do. We also have buy-in. Everybody wants it. So if you look at healthcare consumers in the 20th century like me, we're used to a hierarchical paternal system where the man in the white coat says, thou shalt do this, and that's actually what happens. But in the 21st century, you take out your phone, you Google and actually make decisions. And so we're moving away from traditional models of healthcare, more to prospector, open curious people, tech savvy individuals that are making more decisions for themselves. They're empowered and that's well overdue in healthcare. So we have the right audience, we have the right infrastructure and then because we have the right audience and because people believe in it, you've seen over the last 20 years a complete inversion of the knowledge hierarchy. Instead of top-down approach from very isolated clinical trials with restrictive inclusion and exclusion criteria producing evidence that then is actually disseminated in a generalised way across people that may or may not be suitable for it, we're seeing an inversion of that knowledge hierarchy where multiple sources of information are coming together to empower the patient and provide precise care that is very individualistic, which is good. And finally, we need to be able to solve problems. And there are three big bridges. People have limited access to information. They therefore have poor adherence to guidelines and they're often geographically unable to reach healthcare. And digital solutions really bridge all of those potential opportunities and many, many more solutions as well. So we have the infrastructure, we have far, uh, re receptive patients and public and ourselves, and more importantly, we, we actually have the, the, the problems to solve. And I'll give one or two quick examples. Now, I, I was in practice as a cardiologist for many, many years, and this was not an uncommon problem. To see uh, a middle-aged patient with type 2 diabetes who had developed chronic uh, kidney disease, who had developed cardiac disease, who had hypertension, who had peripheral vascular disease. And it was not uncommon to see parallel universe therapies from each individual physician, even if they're in the same healthcare network. If they're not in the same healthcare network, it can be even worse. And so patients end up falling through the cracks and having ho multiple hospital admissions and acute care, despite the fact that they've had multiple parallel visits with no integration. And I think the beauty of the digital world is being able to integrate and provide true virtual accessibility and bi-directional flow of information between physicians to provide better integration. Now, is this happening now? No, not perfectly, but can it actually happen? And could it reduce the amount of time people spend visiting doctors? Absolutely, and this is an exciting possibility. So that's access. I just want to say a couple of words about equity in healthcare. And this is one of my favourite lines. Of all the forms of inequality, and you could say inequity, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and most inhumane. And I totally believe this after a life in medicine. If we can't provide it fairly for everybody, what are we actually doing? Now, healthcare inequities are numerous, and I haven't got time to go through them all. But there's a, up to a 40-year gap in life expectancy between high and low socioeconomic groups within countries, within cities. If you're a child born in Chad, you have a ch one in five chance of being dead by the time you're five. If you're a child born anywhere in Europe, that is less than one in 10,000 chance of that actually happening. This has got nothing to do with genetics. It's all to do with socioeconomic circumstances, cultural, racial, 
uh, sexual orientation, lots of other things that are determining it. It's not actually uh, related to genetic predisposition to illness. 80% of low income countries have less than one doctor per thou thousand patients. Five billion people across the planet lack meaningful surgical care when needed. And health disparity between the richest and the poorest uh, uh, gap grows during the course of life. Now this actually occurs not only within countries, but across countries, but even within cities. And this is a very important study that basically shows that the average life expectancy at birth uh, varies just along one rail line uh, in, in uh, uh, Chicago. And, and, and again, many cities have the, the same sort of disparity across the, the city just related to socioeconomic circumstances, not genetic predisposition to illness. Across countries, we have the same issues, and the life expectancy varies according to socioeconomic uh, determinants, not to, not to genetics, to socioeconomic determinants. And in here, you'll see I've got the percentiles, uh, the lower, second quartile, third quartile, and upper quartile of life expectancy just in the US. So you can see socioeconomic circumstances do determine that. And there's, even within the US, there's a 20 year difference between the richest and poorest Americans. So I look at digital solutions in terms of access and equity and ask, is it possible that digital solutions in the 21st century may not turn this into a straight line, but it might bring equity and fairness and meaningful uh, balance in, in healthcare, particularly for chronic non-communicable <coughs> diseases across all age groups. So a wise person once said to me, there are only four types of people in the world, those who are caregivers, those who will be caregivers, those who don't know that they're going to be caregivers, and those that ultimately will need being cared for. We're all going to be those people. We're going to be those people. So the future is not something we enter, the future is something we actually create. And um, my excitement of being here is that I genuinely see the opportunity of the digital transformation to modern health care that is meaningful because it's accessible and because it's equitable. Thank you. Thank I'm you. looking forward to all of the innovation. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Meredith. Okay. I the future of healthcare is bright. I'm excited. So I would like to introduce our panel of esteemed judges. Uh, if you can, when your name is called, kind of stand up. But I'd like to start with David Fagan. David is responsible for evolving Boston Scientific's digital health strategy, <laughs> enabling capability building and leading the big data, internet of things, analytics and mobility teams. Thank you. Next, we have Jennifer Griffin. Jennifer Griffin is Vice President of Industry Strategy and Investments at Massachusetts Life, Center, Life Sciences Center. In her role, she develops and manages the investment strategy for initiatives and partnerships with, a, with the life science industry, including private, public, and nonprofit stakeholders in order to support the needs of the Commonwealth's life sciences ecosystem. Thank you. Amy Hamans. Amy is the founder and chief ex ex experience officer of MADPAL, a strategic design consultancy that takes a purpose-driven approach to partnering with clients to deliver social impact and financial return. Thank you. And Marianne Slight. Marianne leads the healthcare analytics team at Google Cloud, with her focus being to apply analytic technologies to healthcare problems in order to make a difference at scale. So thank you. All right, 
It's now going to be time for the, the big show, and I'd like to welcome our first finalist to come up to the stage and present, Dr. Manish Chauhan of Cardio. He is the cardiologist and founder of CardioVision, CardioVisual. <laughs> Good evening. It's a pleasure to represent a cardiovisual and digital platform for clinicians and patients. In the five to 10 minutes that I have with you here on stage is the time that most cardiologists have with their patients to discuss chronic health conditions such as congestive heart failure or atrial fibrillation, as well as the many complex diagnostic and therapeutic uh, procedures that these patients will need. It will be the job of the cardiologist to then clearly and simply explain to the patients. But because of the uh, high patient loads and uh, severe time constraints, we often aren't able to spend enough time with the patients. The clinician may then provide a printed pamphlet or brochure to the patient, but that interaction is, uh, barely occurs at the time of uh, delivery of the product. The patient who's anxious and stressed is often unable to grasp all this information about their own condition and health. Yet, understanding this is vital to what comes next for the patient. As a result, patients will seek a second and maybe a third opinion from their social networks or maybe Dr. Google. <clears throat> the search uh, from patients will often result in a plethora of great resources. But when unguided, it leads patients more confused and anxious. So the challenge for connected patient is multifaceted. And to, and to have a technology solution, we must align a busy clinician and a patient to engage digitally. <clears throat> we believe that the best outcomes in healthcare start with effective information. Our solution is CardioVisual, a digital engagement platform for clinicians and patients. This platform provides curated, condensed, shareable, clinician curated and created educational videos along with digital engagement tools that recommend and guide users to understand and learn about all cardiovascular conditions, treatments, procedures, and devices. This saves time for clinicians to provide multimedia content to their patients at the point of care. On the other hand, the patients get brief videos that are less intimidating and more engaging to help them easily understand their medical conditions and treatments. The CardioVisual app has evolved to save clinicians time, up to 50% time in complex medical discussions. For the patients, they get hours of clinician endorsed videos at no cost. For both the parties, CardioVisual provides an interactive learning platform, as well as new techniques and therapeutics from industry collaborators and medical experts. CardioVisual has grown organically to about 20% of the global cardiovascular clinician market space. Over 300,000 patients have used the CardioVisual app, and our hope is to be the go-to resource for trusted cardiovascular information for patients globally to help those patients at risk of heart disease and the number one killer. The cardiovascular leadership includes several prominent cardiologists, as well as a team of highly committed individuals and experts to find digital solutions for clinicians and patients. Our business model focuses around the value of clinician endorsed content to the users via a freemium model. We also allow industry content providers to deliver new techniques and therapeutics to the clinical ecosystem of cl patients and clinicians in real time. We also focus on licensing agreements with uh, 
providers and uh, related to uh, uh, being an educational uh, content solution. Cardiovisual is a validated content resource and we are expanding our reach to other stakeholders in the healthcare system, such as hospitals and EMR systems, uh, as a, uh, to provide cardiovisual uh, to help empower patients uh, with knowledge globally and to help improve outcomes. I thank you for the opportunity to share uh, our solution with you. Questions. Five minutes of questions. <laughs> thank, th thank you very much. Um, I just, you know, what a tremendous segue from from Ian's speech and and a tremendous example of leveraging digital for access for for democratization and for empowerment. So 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 thank you very much for for the work you do. Um, I do have a question about how do you stay up to speed on the latest and greatest evidence coming in around the world? And how do you ensure that, that the education that you're providing is really leveraging everything in the field, especially as, as you know, AI algorithms figure out new correlations and studies happen around the world? And how do you, how do you make sure that that doesn't create too much of a cost burden? on your business model? Thank you, that's a great question. And thank you, Ian, for setting up my talk. So, <laughs> uh, I think there are three parts to this. I think we really rely on our industry collaboration to provide us with content about new techniques, new devices, new products. We want to be a platform to deliver that content. We rely on experts clinician experts who can use the platform to deliver some of their techniques and newer ways of doing procedures via this platform. We don't have a good way of delivering that information. Patient, uh, people are putting stuff on social media. That's not really where things belong. So this platform helps deliver the new to the patients as well as the clinicians uh, using digital technology. I think for us, it's about building engagement tools, either using AI to maybe curate content that's out there. Uh, so that's on us to work with technologies uh, that we can integrate into a platform so that we can deliver the information to clinicians on the one hand or patients on the other hand to continue to get them engaged. So I hope that answers the question. Yep. Uh, Wow. Um, about patients, how they were included in the design of the product, and how do you know it's working for them? And also, um, uh, how do they find out about it? Right. Great question. I'm a practicing cardiologist. <clears throat> this started because of a pain point I had, which is I was still drawing on a piece of paper and handing that patient information about what procedure they were going to have. So we needed a solution that could explain to the patient. Now, it could be an 80-year-old patient who doesn't understand. It could be a Spanish-speaking patient who doesn't understand. Or it could be a 40-year-old that who understands but is thinking about their family and you know what's going to happen to the job. So the idea was to get patients information that is valid, that's reliable, that comes from the trusted physicians. Uh, <clears throat> we started to build the app from a clinician perspective, but as patients wanted that information, they started to use the app, and then started to share with their families. We've noticed that when I share an app with one patient, they will share with three others, with a caregiver, with a colleague, and some other person that they connect with. So we've grown organically in 100 countries, purely from patients and doctors agreeing that this is great information. We use social media to encourage patients to learn more rather than uh, marketing. So it's a free app, both for patients and clinicians. There is a freemium model, but patients will always get the content for free. The content library keeps increasing. And I think for us, it's really the patient sharing this information because they also care for themselves, but they really care for somebody else as well. So it's a community. Have you thought about the opportunity to use this 
um, to help with recruiting for clinical trials. So not just as a patient learning about what treatment op options currently exist, but what other opportunities are for me to get engaged with trials. This is perfect <laughs> setup for me. Because I, this afternoon. I've never met. <laughs> thank you. Uh, this is, um, I was this afternoon with the BAME Clinical Research Institute, uh, which is I, where I trained uh, many years ago across the river, uh, about two decades ago. Uh, and our goal is to use this platform to deliver information, but also hopefully be able to encourage patients to participate. Again, this is a tool that clinicians are giving to patients. Patients want to learn about what's new. Uh, this is an opportunity for them to reconnect back, either with their clinicians, but also maybe a clinical trials uh, uh, facility that can then be able to provide information to patients. So yes, we're whiteboarding that solution, but that's, that's great. I mean, that's where we're going up to as well. And I have a question too. Have you considered reaching out to the different cardiology societies across the world? <clears throat> um, so yes, we are now partnering initially with hospitals and uh, practices because that's where the initial pain point is. We do have access to all the clinicians anyways that are part of the members. We definitely want to partner, but I think for a lot of the medical societies and uh, organizations, they have their own uh, systems in place that doesn't always support industry directly or working with private cardiologists or private groups. So we're working through their pain points. It's really, we'd love to work with them. Uh, but my goal is to get this information out to as many people as possible. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Cardio Visual. Our next finalist is Amy Lee with Dance for Healing. God. It might seem crazy what I'm about to say. Sunshine, she's here, you can take a <laughs> All right, so how many of you love music or dance? Raise your hand. Ooh, oh, no. Yeah, did you know Creative Arts Therapy can improve quality of life for cancer patients by 50% and reduce pain by 59%? Anyone? Why do I know that? Because I am a stage four cancer survivor. One back to my childhood love. Thank you. Or oh, music and dance and forgot how sick I was. Luckily, I have my mom with me. She empowered me to understand how difficult it is to care for your loved ones. This is why I decided to dedicate my life to helping all chronic patients. Many of us are stuck at home often. Lack of exercise and community support, and it's very easy to fall into depression. Our program makes you match to a compatible buddy and make behavior change fun and easy, like eHarmony for patients. <laughs> Hi, my name is Amy Lee. I'm founder of Dance for Healing. 77% of Americans suffer from physical symptoms due to stress, 73% psychological. I was one of them. In 2011, I ran a marathon. In 2012, I was fighting stage 4 cancer. It was very hard. I won the battle, discovered the healing power of music and dance, now inspired to give back to the community that supported me. When people get sick, they not only have physical fatigue, but also huge mental stress, and become a roadblock to help them heal better. Creative Arts will be improving quality of life for cancer patients by 50%, reducing pain by 59%. Dancing frequently will reduce the risk of dementia by 76%. Increase serotonin, oxytocin, and make you feel more loved and trustful. This is crucial for patients who's going through the most difficult challenge in their life. Patients are also homebound and very easy to fall into depression. We specifically designed our virtual dance platform to address this problem. Based on neuroscience, Dance for Healing uses AI behavior design and gamification to recommend personalized music and dance based on how you feel right now and your health condition over time. Enable them to dance with friends, family, cancer buddies, anyone, anytime, anywhere in the world. Now open your arms wide. Tai Chi. 
In April 2014, we launched our first pilot. Let's see what the patient had to say within four weeks. It was just a, a great class for me. I tell everybody, like, I wasn't sure about the, when you're on the computer. Huh? Virtual. I like that now. <laughs> I just think how maybe I, I only can dance for 15 minutes. Yeah. But now, to say, see, I have some muscle here. Yeah. I can dance for an hour, no problem. Yeah. So, really, I got my energy back. I met an amazing group of people. We are open-minded. We want to try new things to help us. We are very brave, I think. And we dare to express ourselves, even when we know that we are not the best dancers in the world. So we are so fortunate to have all the amazing teachers. You really made a difference in our life. Thank you. So our design is based on Stanford professor B.J. Fox behavior model. For any behavior to happen requires motivation, ability, and prompt. If any of them not exist, behavior change won't happen. We also combining two of the best stress management tools according to APA. Our first program launched with Stanford Cancer Supported Care. Our net promoter score is 91 versus healthcare industry of 24. We're now taking less success to expand to Stanford Cardiovascular Institute because dancing reduced 46% of cardiovascular death. Every 11 seconds, an elder fall and go to ER. Every 19 minutes, an elder die due to a fall. Dancing improves balance and prevents falling. So we also expand to elder care and focus on dementia and fall prevention. There's a ton of YouTube video out there, none of them really specific tailored to patient needs. Our long-term business model is Medicare Advantage Plan Reimbursement. Our go-to-market strategy is launch one-to-one -one match to empower anyone able to support loved ones from anywhere, anytime by partnering with patients and artist groups. So dance with us. <laughs> Like no one is watching, together we can save one million lives. Thank you. I have a question, if I may. Yeah. How do you match the buddies? <laughs> yeah, so that's actually part of our AI uh, pattern painting technology. Um, it goes down to all different dimensions. We, we gather that info based on preference survey. So for example, uh, you know, their the cultural background, because that impacts their preference in music and dance. The energy level, that is an incredible insight that from patient conversations that, to my surprise, if you're in high energy level, you can't dance with someone who's low energy level, even though you might be have similar health conditions. On the other side, if you same energy level, a cardiovascular patient can dance with a cancer patients. Yeah, and then the last one was really interesting. It was personality matching. This is why I say it's kind of e harmony for patients. So imagine someone is outgoing. It's better to match them to someone who's more introvert. So someone actually triggers the other person doing it. <laughs> and we hear that success story from our patients. Yeah. Thank you. I have a, a, a critically important question. Sure. And that's, uh, do, do you have ABBA? or any other disco, because <laughs> a lot of Boston scientific I'm going to get. But yeah. I, I used to be called Disco Dave back in the day. And <laughs> I know I'm going to hear it for that. Yeah. But I, I, I do have a question. I'm, I'm very, first of all, I love it. I think, I think this is, you know, it's like a healthcare app for wellness as opposed yeah. to we have so many kind of wellness apps that are trying to be healthcare. And here you have just uh, a really exciting social platform to 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 really engage people in a very very different way. Yeah. Um, so again, kudos to you. The the my, my question is, how do people use this? Right? Do they keep using it for three to six months? Do they use it temporarily? Is there a large attrition rate, or do they do they continue to stay with it? 
So, so far, we can, we've been on clinical settings. So it's an eight-week program, a combo of both in-person and online. So the first, we will have a lunch party, and then the last, we will have a closing party. And we will track their, uh, their outcome, their um, status before, like both mental and physical. And then at the end of eight weeks, we will track their uh, you know, mental and, and uh, physical uh, improvements, both through biosensor tracking as well as self-report data. And, and then do they sign up again after the eight weeks? Well, what, what percentage sign so up So the eight-week program is run in the clinic, and they have the option to stay after using the digital platform or we engage with the next program. Where are you trying to go next? Uh, <laughs> well, so right now, I'm pretty excited about our partnership with Stanford Cardiovascular Death. I mean, Cardiovascular Institute focus on uh, cardiovascular death, heart failures. Um, and the clinician that we partner with actually just recently did a study with Bollywood Dance, and the data is really high. And she's already got this group of patients called Strong D, like 100 patients in that particular study. And she never done any digital health uh, you know, trials. So this is like a perfect opportunity for us to work together. And we're also actually partnering up with AHA as well. I'm in conversation with one of the EVPs at AHA. Great. Yeah, to sort of build off of the evidence that you'll be generating. Yeah. Um, the B2C model makes a lot of sense to me. I think for B2B, if payers are gonna start paying for this, what kind of evidence do you think you have yeah. to demonstrate to get someone like a payer or even a provider to start paying for something like this? Yeah, so as you can see, you know, um, we actually last year won the MIT Hacking Madison at the Cedar Sinai Accelerator for best business model. And what the judges really like was this uh, one to one match model so that we don't have to wait for this long cycles. Uh, we previously also uh, was part of the top five finalists for Pfizer's uh, Global NBC Challenge. And then um, the patient mentor literally tell us that a lot of patients could benefit from this. It doesn't make sense for you to wait for the long cycle of healthcare adoption. So just launch it. For example, I'm supporting my friend who's going to cancer right now, and I'm paying for her yoga class. So you can do the same thing. So that is exactly inspired by what she shared with us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Okay, our next finalist is Ravi Vangara with Endocure. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Let me just set you standards in terms of what exactly is happening across the endocrine and metabolic uh, disorders. There are estimated 400 million diabetic patients across the globe. In US alone, there are 40 million diabetic patients. And now most of the diabetic patients are going to touch around 650 million patients by 2040 and around 38% obesity alone is there in the US. So there is an urgent need for a common platform which would integrate many of the solutions which are there in pocket solutions. I call it as a pocket solutions which are there. Somebody is developing an app, somebody is developing a device, somebody is doing this and that. So many other alternate solutions are there, but there is no unified solution which is integrating many of the very great solutions which are available in the market. I'm quite happy that Boston, as well as Google, coming up with uh, these kind of solutions, which will enable the patients with a better cure. So now I come here with uh, some of the research which is being carried by some of my research assistants. They have said that diet is going to take care around 35%. Medication carries only 30%. BMI around 15%. That means 50% of the whole treatment is going to be dependent upon the diet. And most of the industries have forgotten what exactly it needs to be done. And we also have done a research on uh, the 
smartwatches, and Statista has conducted a research on that particular aspect, and you have seen the usage is what is being used. The data which is being captured from the smartwatches doesn't reach uh, the doctors as well as uh, the, who exactly are needed into that particular thing. So hence, we are going to propose a solution which is going to integrate the patients, the provider, payer, family, a pharma, and the dietitians. So the number one uh, important factor for this one is if you are endocrine or metabolic disorder, without have support from the family and the dietitians, this disease cannot be controlled or cured. And there is no cure currently at this juncture which will allow the patient to eat at his own will and the cure disease will get cured. So this is the most important factor. Hence, we are having a platform that is going to integrate all the FDA approved devices. We are going to collaborate with the, most of the device manufacturers, whether it is glucose meter, whether it is a BP meter, whether it is an exercise, sleep, variables, ECG, cholesterol, any of these things, there are multiple manufacturers are there. We are, our platform is going to collaborate and integrate all this. All this data at the convenience of the home, the patients will be in a position to get all the data back to the doctors, which the doctor will be able to decide which is the right mechanism which will be suitable for the patients. And then there is a feedback mechanism to the patients so that patients do, can do the corrective actions in that one. The doctor's dashboard will have what is working, what is not working, which patient is working, which patient is deteriorating from red to yellow, and from people who have improved into the green or green to yellow, that will be clear dashboard which will be clearly available to that one. In order to support this particular thing, we have uh, patented a quad uh, diet scale in which we are going to integrate the Google Lens to the delight of the Googles, uh, Google Assistant, <laughs> Google Cloud, Google Analytics, and uh, Google uh, Machine Learning, which will determine all the foods which are placed on the diet scale. And it is going to tell the patient what is the glycemic index as well as the caloric value of that particular value. So that if the caloric value doctor has recommended you some 1,500 calories, if the food placed on the plate is around 2,000, the machine is going to automatically tell, hey, guy, uh, the doctor has recommended you to, uh, 1,500, whereas you are consuming 2,000. Would you like to reduce any of the food kind of thing? And uh, it has all the uh, integrations which are required for the Google Delight. And there are marketly available products which are there. Uh, you can see even General Electric is also getting into such kind of a business. So there is a huge potential in this particular thing. Lastly, since 1855, the syringe has not changed. And uh, we are uh, offering a new syringe, which is having a biometrics as well as a clear display uh, indicating what exactly, whether it is a previous dosage, next dosage, missed dosage. And it would be used only by the relevant people through the biometrics so that you are preventing suicide as well as the homicides with this kind of a thing. This is a new syringe which is going to be a smart syringe. We also named this as a quiz because my parents who consume uh, insulin uh, when, I, when we go to restaurants or anything, I ask them when you take, did you take injection? They feel very sick. That's the reason I use the name as a kiss. I will always ask them, did you kiss? So they understand that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, obviously, this is a this is a grand vision, and and in many ways encompasses what what a lot of us are trying to accomplish. But um, you also have to start somewhere. So, what do you believe is that first smallest solution that you can get to that's actually going to demonstrate viability and value? We actually gone into uh, prototype uh, development because of certain uh, quarantine in some countries. It could not be done. But however, we have done the 3D printing and the 3D design, complete validation, along with other uh, electronic manufacturers. As you see, the Quiz, the smart syringe, it has uh, the complete mobile phone. It has the display. It has the biometrics. It has uh, uh, batteries. It has uh, Bluetooth. You name all the technologies are into there. For example, if I, for example, Quad. I've been in, uh, trying to get in touch with a couple of uh, vendors in the Quad Diet machine, but because of certain limitations, I could not complete the project. 
uh, in time, but uh, in the next uh, couple of months, uh, we will be overcoming that, and then we will be able to uh, demonstrate the live pro products. So it, if you got going to work on a silo basis, the disease doesn't go away. You need to go in attack with complete diet, insulin machines, the complete platform which is going to integrate with all the devices. Then only you are going to help the patients. Otherwise, point solutions are not going to give any treatment. Otherwise, why the people from 450 million, it's going to 650 million? So there is an urgent need for arresting this particular solution. With the help of Boston Scientific and Google, I'm confident that we will be able to rock it. <laughs> Fair enough. Thank you. I have a question. Um, when you think about the demographic where particularly type 2 diabetes has been increasing, how do you propose to reach those people with these kinds of devices? Okay, uh, our uh, intention is to uh, promote this product uh, through the hospitals and the doctors. Those are the people who are going to recommend this particular platform. And uh, that's where uh, the, the if I go and tell, hey, use uh, this particular thing, or if I use an app kind of a thing, because it doesn't have any recommendation from the doctor, people don't use it. Or even if they use it, they don't take it. So my approach is, to get the recommendation from the doctors, doctors will sell this platform. We are not, a doctor is not going to charge anything. We are going to give it at free of cost to the doctors. Make use of this. We will make money through the devices and various other aspects into that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, next we have Richie Bavasso and Teresa Arroyo Galejo with, <laughs> with NQ Medical. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, no doubt most of you have a pretty good handle on the status of your cardiovascular health because they're readily, readily accessible biomarkers, blood pressure, lipid panels. We all have great access. But how many of you understand the uh, status of your brain health? And where would you even go to figure that out? So what uh, NQ Medical is delivering to market is a computational biomarker for neurodegenerative diseases. And we deliver this biomarker vis-a-vis -vis your personal device. So consequently, billions of NQ medical devices are already deployed all over the world. In fact, you probably all have one in your pocket right now. Because um, we believe that uh, one of the things that was missing, I think, in the earlier presentation is adherence. Adherence is a huge problem in healthcare. So even with access, with, when you bring adherence into the equation, you have a problem. So we not only do not use proprietary devices, we are a passive data collection tool. So instead of requiring you, which I think this is an inherent problem in digital health in general, instead of requiring you to be adherent in my application, we're gonna be adherent in your life. You live your life. Whatever you do on a daily basis, we all know how often we use our devices. Every 90 seconds, we're registering a score on your brain health, and we'll show you in a moment what that looks like. So our data, which we'll be sharing with you momentarily, um, point to early detection of disease for diseases like Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, et cetera remote real-world uh, disease progression monitoring and measuring the impact of therapy. So this is a result, this is not voodoo medicine, this is a result of six years of trials, um, starting in sleep inertia and through Parkinson's disease, uh, the, the scrutiny of uh, peer-reviewed journals, uh, and some significant institutions who are supporting uh, expanding our application from sleep inertia to Parkinson's disease to Alzheimer's, MCI, multiple sclerosis, ALS, and concussion. So this is a broad-based brain health platform. Um, as I mentioned earlier, our data uh, in each and every one of our studies were compared to the gold standard. So we need to do as good as or better than the gold standard. And in this particular instance for Parkinson's, we did better. And we think as our data set grows, we can get closer to the venal conversion date of these diseases and really begin to apply. At some point, there will be a disease-modifying therapy for Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, and we want to be there with the early detection tool. This is a picture of a, um, a typing signature. We all have a unique 
typing signature. So it stands a reason if you're a person with a disease, you would look different than normal. So normal is up on the top. You have uh, mild symptoms. That's a de novo patient, newly diagnosed, not on medication. And then to the, to the left is a severe patient with Parkinson's. And you can just imagine the number of iterations between mild and severe that the human with any diagnostic test can't see. But we can see each subtle incremental change. Again, every 90 seconds of every hour that you're using your device, we're initiating a score. And then in terms of impact of therapy, this is a DBS patient. This was our patient zero. Gave us the ability to kind of show therapy and no therapy within 30 seconds. And you can see even with the native uh, eye that there's a difference between DBS on and DBS off. Transitioning to DBS only, we have data on medication therapy to DBS. So that, that light red line that's horizontal, that's a threshold. Everything below that line is normal motor. Everything above that line is a, a disease individual. So you can see on the, on the far, I guess your left, um, those spikes, that's a person whose drug, fail, uh, drug regimen has failed. And then a DBS um, surgery where the imp, um, um, electrodes were implanted and then later on the ele electrostimulation was turned on and that patient is near normal. So this is a quantification of that activity. Uh, also moving to pure drug trials, um, using our tool, we were able to, to demonstrate drug response at week three with a traditional gold standard, it took 24 weeks in that particular trial to show that the drug was working. So most interesting, I believe, is as we study all these different diseases, we've now been able to parcel out neuromotor uh, problems and cognitive problems by what you're doing on your device. So this is the brain finger connection interacting with a personal device, and there are certain activities that are more cognitive in inclined and certain activities that are more motor inclined. Uh, our business model is very simple. Uh, right now, pre-FDA approval, we're supporting clinical trials. You can imagine uh, recruiting participants from home. So rather than having to come to the clinic, get assessed and told to go home because they don't qualify for the trial, we can assess them from home and then have them come to the clinic if they do qualify. Um, showing uh, real world evidence during the trial, disease progression, and then because we can track disease progression, we can show does that compound device or other therapy work at the earliest possible moment. Uh, we were very pleased to be granted breakthrough status by the FDA this past November. And we certainly, in Parkinson's disease, is a de novo application. Parkinson's disease is our first um, disease disorder, and we will be the, uh, our own predicate for the other diseases going forward. So 2020 is going to be a great year for us. Um, we will have statistically significant data on all these other diseases. We very much hope to have our FDA clearance by the end of the year. Um, and interestingly, where we are as a company, um, kind of at this, this divide, we all know that major technology companies like Google are moving into healthcare. We all know that traditional healthcare companies like Boston Scientific are moving in, into technology. We're kind of happy being in the middle, kind of bridging this, um, this opportunity for collaboration. Thank you. <laughs> Fantastic yeah. uh, applications, and uh, kind of—I'm sure the Google folks feel the same way. I'd love to get my hands on that data, right? Um, how do you? How do you? Just explain to me how you actually get this into the hands of uh, patients or users. Is it? Is it prescribed? How do you go to market? How does it? Yeah. Um, no, okay. Good. Yeah. Good point. And, I, and this is my fifth company in this space, and uh, I. Direct to consumer is not where I'm going, okay? Right now, clinical trials, subsidized research with life science companies. Okay. Then uh, moving from there to a companion therapeutic, companion diagnostic, also subsidized by life science companies. We are beginning to explore the new um, CM CPT codes for remote right. disease monitoring. We're starting with the VA, so that'll be a distribution mechanism. Uh, ultimately, um, don't know how it'll get wide distribution, but we think the best model is through clinical trials, that's the drug companies or the medical device companies worry about distribution, meeting their business needs, and then um, once it's a reimbursable event, you know, the doctors will prescribe it. Thank you. Okay. And what's going to be required for a reimbursable event? Are you claiming you're going to 
sorry, reimbursable, the drug is reimbursable. Right? No, no, the, 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 our tool is used as a remote disease monitoring device for the clinician using one of those six CPT codes for remote disease monitoring. In terms of early diagnosis, um, what are your thoughts in terms of getting that into the marketplace? Well, it's interesting. Um, again, through our channel partners, which would be the medical device and pharma companies, they would have a business interest in, in distributing that vis-a-vis -vis their marketing campaigns, vis-a-vis -vis their sales forces, et cetera. Um, I do not have current designs to do direct to consumer. I would hope that at some point I partner with somebody who has that capability uh, and distribute to them, white license it through them, and or um, we're a software company, and that's what we want to maintain that status. Um, but I think there'll be plenty of people out there willing. I'll give you an example, a good question. I'm sorry, I just thought of this because I have a little dementia myself. Uh, we're partnering with a Japanese insurance company that sells dementia insurance. And they're very interested in distributing this in Japan. And they will bear that burden of distribution. Can you talk about the user experience then? The user's just using then phone as normal and does the battery life drain or no. how does that work? You want to see that one? Yeah, I can do that one. Good. Yeah. Uh -huh. So the data collection software is essentially a background service. In the case of mechanical keyboards, it's a, a keylogger that doesn't collect the content of what you're typing. In the case of smartphones, it's a third party keyboard that you install and you set up as your default keyboard and it works as your like usual keyboard in the phone. So as far as you, you know, go through the installation and set up, you can forget about it after that. Yeah, so if you have bad user experience, you blame Google for the answer, <laughs> Apple for their, because it's not ours. Thank you. Okay, Great. thank Wonderful. you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, our fifth finalist, Julia Rose with the genie. Hi, where am I? Hold on. Don't start my time yet. I'm very nervous about the time. Am I going through someone else's? There I am. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Julia Rose. I am the CEO and founder of Kalika, and we are creating the Vagini. So what is the Vagini? Well, the Vagini is a connected, gamified, biofeedback pelvic floor muscle training program to help women strengthen their pelvic floor muscles. Basically, we are making a uh, pelvic Kegel exercise fun and easy so that women can enjoy pain-free, shame-free, body-confident lives. The pelvic floor is a basket of muscles that sits in the pelvis. It is responsible for supporting the, the bladder, the uterus, and the rectum. And for many reasons, uh, most especially because of pregnancy and childbirth, but also for other reasons, such as surgery, uh, hormone changes, getting older, um, uh, being a high-impact athlete like a runner, uh, those pelvic muscles can get weak. And as a result, a woman can suffer from uh, from. Uh, Disorders such as incontinence, prolapse, hip pain, back pain, and even sexual dysfunction. Luckily, there is a very simple exercise that women can do to keep their muscles strong and healthy, an exercise that uh, healthcare experts deem as one of the five most important exercises can do for women. And that exercise is Kegels. The problem with Kegels, they are boring and difficult to figure out how to do. So what we do is we not only teach a woman how to do her exercises correctly, but we make it fun. And the way it works is when a woman has a few minutes in her day, she takes her device, she puts it in her body, it connects via Bluetooth to the app, and we take her through a gamified biofeedback game. It's basically a video game. And then we track and chart her progress. And this kind of method is very effective. In fact, if you give birth in France, which I did, you get to take part in a program that basically takes you through this kind of method. And it's a little more clinical, but it's the same idea. And the reason they do it, as a result, two thirds, uh, women, French women are two thirds less likely to get pelvic disorders than we are here in the United States. 
pelvic disorders are also very expensive. Right now, almost one in five women are going to get surgery for pelvic floor disorders. 30% are going to go back for additional surgery. And incontinence costs the US healthcare system over $80 billion a year. Uh, so healthy and strong pelvic floor muscles are really great for all women, not just because uh, we can prevent disorders, but also for the many, many benefits, including heightened sexual response. Um, so that's a big market. But even if we look at uh, our early adopters, someone like me, a mom, I've got two kids, I have a little bit of a disposable income, and I have a little problem with leaking and I want to get my body back in order, we're already looking at a $3 billion market. And we love our early adopters right now because millennials make up about 82% of women giving birth, and they are tech savvy, they are uh, very excited about preventative health, and they are, they are all about trying new and exciting brands. Our app will not only offer the biofeedback kale training, but we'll have a lot of other um, engaging incentives, such as tracking your f fertility cycle. Also, there is not a lot of information out there, um, data about pelvic function, so we can establish ourselves as an industry aggregator of pelvic health data. Um, so the, we will have we will offer three tracks when we launch our product. The first will be for recovery and fitness. This is great for postpartum or for just maintenance. We will also offer a meditative app, which will bring awareness and healing to the pelvic area. And we will offer the fertility track, which will help women track their menstrual cycle and maybe even prepare their bodies for pregnancy. Our device is being created by some of the best engineers in the country. It is easy to use. We have our manufacturing sorted for the first couple of years. Uh, here's just an example of our patent at work, we are really targeting the pelvic muscles. And if a woman follows our program, you can have good results within two to four weeks, so it's pretty quick. Uh, we are winning awards both in the consumer vertical and in healthcare. Uh, we do have a US um, patent issued. We are also patent pending in China and Hong Kong. And we have people reaching out to us all the time for this product, not just future customers, but like clinics where physical therapists are desperate for a product that can help support their program. Uh, the great thing about the Vagini is it is accessible, it is inexpensive, and it's uh, uh, very effective. Uh, there Pelvic, I'm running out of time. The uh, connected pelvic floor uh, training is becoming a bit more of a conversation, but we are one of the only US-based companies ready to launch in this uh, in the US market. Really interestingly, there are programs in uh, France and the UK that have already proven that if we launch a healthcare initiative here, we can save payers about 70, $28 billion a year. Um, so this is my amazing team, and uh, I can tell you a little bit more about them, but I will say this, we are raising funds, looking for strategic partners to help us take to go to market this year, and uh, it's really great to be here, so thank you so much. Is it, is it obvious that I should go first on this one? 100%. I'm actually going to recuse myself. If it's no! But no, no, it's... A, it's a, very exciting uh, opportunity. I mean, we, we we are in the urology space, and we 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 know the 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 pain and the emotional aspect, and we, we have a lot of therapies yeah. um, in this space. So it's very interesting. I, I am uh, I'm always curious about the compliance and and the ease of use, and you know how what was the experience? How was it? So it's really interesting. I mean, that is that is the product is is the engagement and keeping uh, the the user engaged and using the product so you can have an effective outcome. Um, we the biggest th my experience in France was really eye opening because what was happening is I they you know I walk in they give me this device I'm connected to the monitor they flip it on I'm playing a video game essentially and I'm thinking oh my gosh this is crazy but I'm paying attention to the game and I did it for half an hour which is unheard of and I did it for a number of weeks and I thought that was what was so fascinating. So it really is going to be about the quality of the engagement, so basically the games, the, the encouragement you get seeing your progress. We have all sorts of other things we might do. Like we, we just want to get creative and have fun. And um, I think also, again, going back to the remote monitoring, now that that is, um, that is covered, you can even get your physical therapist or your doctor involved and even knowing that they're kind of keeping an eye on it. <laughs> you know, you, you, you don't want to be a bad patient. <laughs> Great. Yeah. yeah, my question, sorry was about sort of the engagement of, of physical therapists. So I, I'm sure you're aware there's a huge dearth of physical therapists that specialize in pelvic floor um, dysfunction. And so I wonder if there's an opportunity to um, really engage them and have them be sort of extensions of you and your company, but then also provide feedback back to them to help with the stickiness. If, so I think if you're if you're hearing from your physical therapist that, hey, you're doing great, or actually you guys, you gotta kick it up a notch, 
potentially that would help with your with your stickiness. And I'm also wondering um, if they were what was involved in the development of sort of the biofeedback and and how you developed that that the yeah. data that went into that. Yes. So to the first part, we you're absolutely right. Whether I'm talking to a, you know, um, a facility with multiple pelvic floor physical therapists in Los Angeles, which is where we're based, or to the single pelvic floor therapist for 40 miles in State College, Pennsylvania, they all, they've all been reaching out to us because they do need a tool. They have waiting lists four to six weeks long. They do need a tool that they can use where they have their you know, client come in, train them for a little bit, and then say, okay, now you can go home and do this at home. We'll see you once a month instead of once a week or twice a week. So they're very excited about a product like this. To date, they have not found a product out there that works well for them. So we work very closely with them to create the, the product that we do have. Okay. Um, your second question was, how do we create? So we worked with ob and physical therapists. And so we're creating programs. Quite frankly, they're not that different. It's really more about how often you do it, how long you do it. But there's, there's only a few basic um, exercises you're going to end up doing. So we just want to make it fun. Like I, whether it, 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 We're going to start with these few games, but I think as we develop and as we get to know our customer and as we understand, as we get the data points in, we'll be able to customize accordingly. I have a question. How do you differentiate yourself between the electrostimulation devices that are quite common in, for example, the UK? And is that a demographic thing as well? Uh, so a few things to that. So one is that because we are not using any, any electrostimulation, we, um, we have the ability to launch without getting a, a Fed, FDA regulatory clearance. We can just come in as an exercise aid. Um, that being said, we are going to pursue the clearance because it's not that difficult. There are predicate devices out there. There are reimbursement codes out there. There's now the remote monitoring out there. There's all sorts of reasons. Um, in my research uh, and in the studies we've been looking at, it seems like learning your learning how to do the exercise yourself is the most effective way. It also empowers the woman to, you know, do it wherever she is, whenever she is. And so I think the results are stronger. So it's always good to know how to do it better yourself. Then you can also uh, prevent problems like like you'll learn uh, certain techniques that will just um, benefit you in your daily life as well, without getting too deep into it. <laughs> Yeah, that was, that was the nature of my question. Once you know if you're doing it right, integrate it into your daily habits so that it's while driving or while toothbrushing and things like that, which leads me to my question, um, have you thought about it for, um, you know, you, you have the child and, you know, you come back, like integrating it into it, so it's sort of a preventive thing as opposed to, you know. Yes, absolutely. So that's why we want to do programs. I think it's really important to have the postpartum recovery program, the preparing for pregnancy program, the perimenopausal program, the postmenopausal program, the young woman who's barely thinking about it program. I mean, I think that's what's going to really keep women engaged, um, as well as some other things. I think we'll have like little competitions and, you know, I mean, there'll be fun things we can do. I mean, play your friends. I don't know. Just say it. <laughs> the three of us are playing. Yeah, right can now. I play? <laughs> <laughs> anyone? Anyone? Thank you so much. Oh, wow, the future of digital health. Uh, okay, our final finalist is Abhishek Shah with Wealthy Therapeutics. Can you go back slide. some slides? Going back. You Unless can. you want to do Virginie again. Yeah. <laughs> I, we want to hear it from a male point of view. Oh. <laughs> 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 uh, super. Last but not least. Uh, Thank you everyone for having me here. Uh, my name is uh, Abhishek. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Wealthy Therapeutics. So Wealthy was born out of a question that can we meaningfully inspire and enable 10 million patients to improve their chronic condition by 2030? Uh, and in doing so, could we stay within the rule book of healthcare that effectively meant uh, working with existing stakeholders to improve their health outcomes? and not necessarily sort of work B2C. So can we help um, payers influence uh, outcomes more? Can we take providers into value-based care faster? 
Can we help pharma achieve real world evidence? Can we help device to be able to go closer to influencing outcomes? And in doing all of this, can we stay true to proven medical interventions that have already worked in clinic and hospital settings, have the evidence to show that outcomes are a given, and then reimagine that for delivery through a smartphone so that we can really empower patients to improve their own health outcomes. Our platform was effectively built just for that. For patients, it means upskilling themselves to manage a condition by going through a therapeutic journey in a guided way while ensuring real-time feedback on both manual and uh, connected device parameters that come in through the system. Having a account accountability buddy with you through that journey while ensuring that all of this data is available real time for remote coaches and paramedicals, physicians for uh, remote patient monitoring and for clinical decision support at the time of the next appointment, and population level analytics because there's a lot of data coming our way. We started in type two diabetes, we expanded that to chronic kidney disease, hypertension, dyslipidemia, heart failure, ischemic heart disease and asthma across four uh, therapeutic areas, and we're obviously going deeper into each one of them. And oncology and women's health are sort of coming up right after. Essentially, if I had to spotlight just the patient journey, right? A patient gets the end-to-end -end experience as a guided digital therapeutic. How can you help a patient with every metric that they input or every data point that we collect through connected devices and give them real-time feedback? How do we use videos, lessons, quizzes, challenges, audiobooks, and, and podcast-type content to be able to upskill first their education and then their ability and their motivation to manage a condition? At the same time, how do you make sure it's the, it's the patient themselves? That means it's not the condition, it's multimorbidity on day one and ensuring that you close the loop with the cultural nuances that matter because patients don't always speak English or don't speak the same sort of, uh, or don't have the same cultural background and gamify so that you can engage. We started this journey with some very specific goals that can we improve real world outcomes at home? Whether it's reducing hypo events and therefore uh, hospitalization risk and diabetes, whether it's in heart failure, us improving the 30, 60, 90 day hospitalization risk again over there, or for asthmatic patients, how can we help improve the symptom-free days and thereby reduce ER visits and hospitalization visits again? This consistency has sort of led us to be commercialized in 2019. We're now today, at least in India, which is our first market, uh, the only mobile prescription therapy that is actually prescribed on, uh, on the prescription to patients by many, many healthcare institutions. We started working with insurers really, really deeply. We started with life insurance, where whether it's a couple of markets now in Asia, where we're working to reduce critical illness risk for life insurance and improve the length of life. And as a result, help improve the quality of life and patient outcomes for the members that are covered. For health insurance, we're working towards reducing risk again, but thereby reducing claims, thereby reducing premiums over a period of time. And with reinsurers, we're actually reimagining underwriting rules altogether, where we're working with reinsurers to improve the way in which products can be delivered to the other six billion people out there who today may not have access to adequate insurance out there. We work really closely with pharma, whether it's Pfizer, it's Ferrer, it's Intas, we work as a combination therapeutic. In, in fact, if you see the examples, whether it's Novartis or Cipla in select cardiology and diabetes, drugs were actually combined and marketed a pan country as a combination digital therapy on top of the drug. And this is essential because the goal is you have to solve for access. At the same time, you have to make sure it's affordable, which means that somebody needs to pay. But most importantly, we're in it for real world outcomes. With uh, device companies like Roche, we're combined as a combination on top of their medical device to deliver integrated patient diabetes management, and that re leads to better health outcomes, right? And in the process, we're collecting in millions of data points and powering incredible clinical decision support and population level analytics along the way, right? Because we're delivering outcomes and that's what matters the most. We've published 20 publications so far, more coming, improvement in A1C, 
post meal, pre meal, hypo episodes, activity, blood pressure. We're working across multiple countries, multiple cultures. We started, we commercially went live in 2019. We've had incredible catalysts help us, but it's been clinical associations that have given us a thumbs up and work with us closely, insurance accelerators, pharma accelerators that has gotten so far. And now with a 100 member team, which is just uniquely positioned for tech design, clinical, and partner success. We're well on our way to achieve that same goal of improving 10 million patients' health outcomes by 2030. Thank you so much. It seems like um, you're able to prove the health outcomes side of things. What about the economic outcomes? Have you been, had good tracking there with, with Roche and with some of the insurance companies? You've it's a great question. Um, in fact, because we worked in uh, emerging markets, uh, the health economics uh, actually work in our favor. When you're delivering care in those markets, you're actually delivering it at cents a day or you know, a few dollars a month. That ability in, that not only works for HOER data in that market, but essentially serves as a great base to ensure that that same data when transferred, as long as you can show equivalent outcomes in uh, more expensive markets or you know, payer-driven markets, it actually is, you know, th there's a lot of cost benefit. So yes, to your answer, HOER is already proven for the markets in which we're operating. But more interestingly, because we were built to deliver care at such a low cost, it enables us to work in, in, in other markets at a, at a brutally low cost. What's your patient sat? Patient satisfaction? Oh, uh, we, we, well, we track it at a, at a rating scale. So it's right now about four to 4.1. It hovers around there on five. And can you talk a bit about your roadmap for the future? Absolutely. So uh, going deeper into the therapeutic areas that we've already gotten into um, and going broader in, in select ones, so oncology and women's health being the two uh, that are on our roadmap from a, from a, from a, a clinical perspective or from a, from a condition perspective. Uh, depth in terms of the technology roadmap is uh, connected devices as mainstream, where anyway there, any connected device which integrates into Apple HealthKit or Google uh, Fit, we're already in. But more importantly, how do you take those biomarkers and start intersecting and then analyzing them better? And then how do you take, uh, as we go into deeper integrations with the respective health systems, that's the interesting bit. Because now you're taking patient journey data, which healthcare has never seen, seen before, and you're integrating it with health data, both retrospectively and prospectively, which we've never seen before. And that combination will help us to go into prediction, which is where we want to get to. Not prediction of the, uh, from, a, from a diagnostic perspective, but prediction from a risk mitigation perspective, because we're still in the business of improving health outcomes. So you, you say you're a, a combination therapy. So are you actually in the clinical trial, or is it meaning does, does the app have to go with the pharmaceutical? It doesn't have to, but it is combined with. So we've shown the real world evidence. So the, um, not every market works like the US. So you have uh, different markets of different regulatory pathways. Um, and in markets, select markets in Asia, the ability to show outcomes uh, in the real world almost uh, precedes or is given added benefit than clinical trial data because I think a lot of the world is moving very clearly into that genre. So real world outcomes beats clinical trial outcomes in a lot of use cases, especially for uh, these sort of therapeutic areas. So what we did was first show real world outcomes and then combine with the mm -hmm. kind of partners that you're seeing where they've gone through their sort of approval process mm -hmm. to come out with this being a combination for their drugs. Great. And, and you talk about uh, linking into health data and the health system data. How ha, have you done that yet? Have you kind of crossed that hurdle in, in India and with all the fragmentation and all the different sim systems? And So I think you've answered you part of the question, right? So uh, EMR, EHR penetration <coughs> in that market is right. very, very poor. But to be honest, that's one of several markets that we're entering. So while, yes, the, the, the organized EMR, EHR players were integrated or integrating with, uh, the real interesting bit is that the rest of the world, as we're entering into other markets, and you'll see a few more announcements, uh, those are, are more or less sorted. So integrating into your public payer system, uh, your, your public health systems and your private health systems, they all have the ability for a unique patient identifier code, and then you mapping it to yours, and thereby 
thereby, thereby as long as you're complying with the respective data security and privacy norms, you're able to move in and capture that data pretty effectively. But for us, what's most important is that we use the data as a raw material today. We don't actually, have you not started selling the data or doing any sort of monetization model on that data? We're in the business of outcomes, and therefore for us, our primary goal is can we improve outcomes and any raw material of the data that comes off the patient that can effectively help in that journey is something that we're more interested in. Great. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. I get all the tools. Okay, thank you so much to our six fabulous finalists. Round of applause. And now it's going to be the hard work for the judges. So while our judges are doing their work, I would like to invite Dr. Mallory Franklin to come up from Nutramenity. And they were our last year's winner. And she's going to provide us some insights and uh, what's it, what is it like being a startup in the digital healthcare space? So thank you. And All right, great, thank you so much. Um, it's great to be back here for the fifth annual Connect to Patient Challenge. Um, I'm honored to be invited back as the winner of last year's challenge. Um, and I just wanna give a quick congratulation to all the finalists here tonight. Um, having been in your shoes last year, uh, I just wanted to say it's a lot nicer being up here without being grilled by the judges. No offense, you guys are really nice, but <laughs> it's, it is a little intimidating. Um, so for those of you that weren't here last year, um, I'm the Chief Clinical Officer Officer for Nutrimity. We are a digital health startup focused on the next generation for medical nutrition therapy. Our proprietary web and mobile platform provides nutrition care and access to registered dietitians right in the hands of patients. Our mission is to give patients the know-how and confidence to answer the question, what can I eat? A question that's important for the over, the over 100 million Americans who are managing a chronic condition. So like other startups here tonight, uh, we work tirelessly because of this mission. Um, with the long hours, late nights, and weekends, uh, we often say that Nutrimity runs on coffee. Um, and no, I will not be commenting on the nutritional implications of excessive coffee intake. <laughs> but to be a successful startup, um, you have to be resilient in the face of failure, and you have to be keen on celebrating small wins to keep yourself motivated. Um, so for us, you know, that could be something as small as uh, someone pronouncing the name of our company correctly. So Heidi, I would like to say you nailed it, <laughs> but you're close. And I understand it's a hard one. We should have picked something different. Um, <laughs> So uh, as a startup, you innovate and connect parts of healthcare that have never been connected before. You ask the big picture questions about why things are done the way they are, who are the key decision makers, um, and a lot of, wouldn't it be great if? So for us, you know, that could be, wouldn't it be great if Sue, with end-stage renal disease, was alerted that the spinach salad she is about to eat could land her in the hospital with life-threatening hyperkalemia? So nutrition is an intricate yet often overlooked aspect of healthcare, and we couldn't be more excited to be leading the conversation around innovation and nutrition care. Um, we work with a lot of stakeholders and we're focused on high risk populations that have the greatest need. So these include kidney disease, um, inflammatory bowel disease, cancer, as well as heart failure. So I'm happy to say that starting Monday, Monday, wow, we are launching with dialysis providers across the state of Oregon answering the question, what happens to nutrition care as patients move to home dialysis? Uh, we work with a global pharmaceutical company uh, who offers our service to patients with inflammatory bowel disease, addressing the issue of access to nutrition care for conditions that aren't traditionally covered by insurance. And we do all of this and a lot more while also fundraising. <laughs> so because without investments from a team of investors who see our vision as clearly as we do, none of this is possible. So to be successful, a lot of people have to believe in your mission, 
what is good for the patient also has to be sustainable and profitable in our current healthcare landscape. That's why working with large organizations such as Boston Scientific and Google is frankly critical for the survival of startups. Um, these global superpowers set the stage for healthcare innovation and their willingness to support and collaborate with startups like myself and all the finalists here tonight is truly how healthcare evolves. Which is why I'm, ha I'm thrilled to announce um, that we've been working with Boston Scientific on a collaborative research study um, where we're looking at the correlation between diet and heart failure. By combining our areas of expertise, we're able to assess um, patient dietary intake using the Nutrimity platform and look at physiological trends in patients with heart failure using Boston Scientific's state-of-the-art heart logic device. Together, for the first time, we can understand the role nutrition plays in the progression of heart failure and do more around diet to better manage this condition. So as we grow and continue to transform clinical nutrition care with um, collaborators such as Boston Scientific, we may one day eliminate the question that so many patients struggle with, which is, what can I eat? So thank you so much and have a good night. Oh my goodness, you guys work fast. Um, before we do the, the big reveal and, and announce our winners, we wanna invite everyone to come out, have dessert and drinks and do some more networking and let's celebrate five years of Boston Scientific Connected Patient challenges, finalists, winners, and, and all of you. So um, before we make some announcements and thank all of our wonderful um, participants and the people that make this possible. I also want to have Jennifer Griffin come up from the Massachusetts Life. Run, run, run! <laughs> because we have a Spotlight Award. We do. And there's a microphone right there and I'm going to let you <laughs> Present. Um, so on behalf of the Massachusetts Life Sciences Center, uh, we're so excited to be here, partnering with Boston Scientific and Google and giving out a um, spotlight award to NQ Medical. So congratulations. So this is um, a $25,000 award to use as you see fit. So congratulations. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I've been told. <laughs> so first, before we award our, our final two uh, Connected Patient Challenge, I'd like to thank all of the, the people that, that helped to make this event possible. It does take a lot of planning and a lot of work, and I specifically want to call out some of the folks from Boston Scientific that have been a part of this for the last five years, and that would be Dr. Mark Bowden, Dr. David Fagan, Kate Haranis, is Kate out there? Hi, Kate. <laughs> Dr. David Knapp, <laughs> Dr. Steve Reintz, Steve. <laughs> Randy Scheisel, Katie Schur, and Dr. Kate Taylor. <laughs> Thank you so much for sponsoring this event. And now I'd like to have David Fagan come up to present our winner in second place. And when ap <laughs> after the awards are made, we'd like the finalists and the winners to, to stick around so we can do pictures and things afterwards. You get that, and there's a Perfect. microphone right there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for, for coming. It was just a tremendous uh, event as usual, but especially uh, especially today. So the second place or runner-up winner, Wealthy 
Therapeutics. Now, now I know why you had me do this. All right. <laughs> I get it. I get it. And the first place winner, the genie. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Um, so hand it back to you. To um, let folks I, go. I think Should that go, um, go enjoy. Thank you so very much for being here. Five years. Yep. Five years. And more to come. And amazing things have happened during that time. So. Um, we'll keep the finalists and, and winners for some pictures, and we'll see all of you out there for a celebratory drink and some dessert. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs>